Welcome. I'm Jan Painter, and this is Politics Matters. Our guest today is Brian Moran, one of the gubernatorial candidates for governor of Virginia, formerly of the 46th District of the Virginia House of Delegates. Welcome, Brian. Nice to be with you, Jan. For the populace, election politics is the ultimate job interview. Of course, in this case, prospective employers, often people without jobs, losing hard-won businesses, lacking health care coverage, or standing on the precipice of being forced to relinquish their houses due to inflative mortgage prices or restrictions on refinancing. So up steps the newest political candidate. He or she is hungry for a job that many of us, frankly, wouldn't want. However, we all want them to do the job right. And now, of course, with a downturn more than ever. Like all employers, the voting public has high hopes for all their prospective employees. Hearing about application after application, and then they begin to come in late, not to stick, to do only maybe half the job, if the job's done at all. At least that's how we see it. Maybe they begin taking an item here and there. It wouldn't be missed, but it's made off with. Here we were, once bright and hopeful citizen employers whose belief and optimism has vanished. Still in all, we want to believe. And the last election for many of us clinched that hope. So Brian, tell us if you would about your background mm -hmm. and qualifications for the job. Why do you want the job and why should we hire you? That's wonderful because you know I I was in Charlottesville uh, this morning, spoke to a group, and uh, I laid it out just in that way. I said, you know, this, I'm applying for a job, uh, and here is my resume. I have a mission statement, I have a body of work, and my experience, as well as references. And I mentioned the wonderful references I have in this area, former Congressman L.F. Payne and his wife Susan and many others here, um, activists in, in Charlottesville area. And then I talked about my body of work. Um, that I've served in the legislature for 13 years, first elected in 1995, and in 2001, when Democrats um, took a beating at the polls and we were down to 33 members out of 100, my peers chose me to serve as their caucus leader. And that meant a couple of things. It, it uh, meant politically I traveled the Commonwealth, traveling hundreds of thousands of miles, recruiting candidates to run for the House of Delegates. I went into uh, uh, communities all over Virginia, from Galax to Fairfax, and, and we won seats that had previously been held by Republicans, Lynchburg, Loudoun, Prince William, Virginia Beach. And now we are uh, on the cusp of gaining the majority in the House of Delegates, which, which is important because we, we recruited candidates that are pro-education, pro-environment, pro-opportunity, uh, pro-economic development, and uh, pro-higher education. So those are candidates I was able to recruit, and that's why we've been able to move Virginia forward in any number of areas. In addition to the political success, body of work is such, in the legislature um, of 13 years, I've, I've gotten a lot, of, lot done, a lot of substantive legislation. Um, I've bridged regional divides um, and partisan divisions. Could you give us an example of yeah. some of the legislation? Absolutely, just, just last year, I um, championed Alicia's Law, which cracks down on online child sexual predators. And I reached across the aisle to gain Republican support for that because we, 20,000 computers in Virginia contain child pornography, uh, but we don't have the resources for our law enforcement officers to properly investigate all those individuals. And this was um, a, a legislation to help our law enforcement with the training and the resources necessary to find those predators and bring them to justice and, and, and um, put them away so that they no longer offend our young people. Uh, oh, and that came from Alicia's Law, and that was my legislation. The year before that, I championed Business One Stop, which allows small businesses to start up here in Virginia free of charge over the internet, so you don't have to t spend time with forms and, and costly um, hiring a lawyer mm -hmm. and so forth. Mm -hmm. And that was actually my legislation. It was recognized by the National Federation of Independent Businesses as well as the Northern Virginia Technology Council. It was a strong piece of legislation. In addition to that, public safety issues. I mm -hmm. cracked down on drunk drivers 
and um, so in a number of areas I have mm -hmm. a body of work that recognizes obviously not only who I am, what I'm about, what I want to do, but also demonstrates my ability to reach consensus, reach across the aisle, reach across regional divides, you know, from southwest Virginia mm -hmm. to northern mm -hmm. Virginia, Hampton Roads, and central Virginia. So, and then the mission statement, you okay. know, why should vo voters choose Brian Moran? Uh, well, I've laid out some specific proposals of how we move Virginia forward. Okay. How Give do me we your get top this six. Top, good. Uh, first, drug, the economy. Let's talk about jobs and the mm -hmm. economy. I'm a small business person, so I want to focus on building this economy from the ground up, not the top down. And that means working with our small businesses in Virginia. I was in Charlottesville uh, on the mall to announce my small business package. Uh, a small business job creation tax credit, $2,000 for every employee you hire. That will stimulate the economy, also eliminate the corporate income tax for struggling small businesses. I also want to stimulate the economy by putting money back into the pockets of hardworking Virginians by indexing the minimum wage, providing a refundable earned income tax credit. That's so great, just if I may interject for a minute, uh, because here in Virginia, as you know, you've heard a lot of people saying, we're small businesses, we cannot get those small loans, maybe 100000 maybe 500000 to keep the business going. Right, right. Uh, and it's a real problem because the STEM is not going to kick in enough for those folks. They'll be right. underwater. Right. That, that, that's why I believe Virginia should have their own stimulus package mm -hmm. in working with small businesses. Ninety percent of employment is small businesses. You know, I've traveled all over Virginia, Main Streets all across Virginia, Main Street in mm -hmm. Bristol, Broad Street in Richmond, Granby Street in Norfolk. I want those small businesses to stay open. When did you come to Virginia? Uh, 1980, well, I came to Virginia many times. I spent my college summers here in high school years, and then uh, I came to law school at Catholic University in Washington, D.C., lived in Alexandria. Um, when I graduated law school, uh, I became a clerk for the circuit court and then became a prosecutor. I prosecuted in Arlington County for seven years, and that's when uh, one night 15 years ago, Mark Warner encouraged me to run for the House of Delegates. Is that where you became particularly sensitive to issues of, of rape and, and child abuse and well, so forth I, I, during your work at that right, time? Right. Uh, prosecutor, mm -hmm. I uh, became obviously very knowledgeable about victims' rights, and I have mm -hmm. a long record in the legislature um, working with victims and victims' rights. And, and also, you know, our criminal justice system is not just about punishment, but it should be about prevention. And I, I want to work, and I have, uh, on issues with respect to more drug courts, drug prevention uh, programs and treatment, um, mental health. You know, I, before I became a legislator, I, I was a prosecutor, and I was on a um, volunteer board in the city of Alexandria. And our responsibility was to interview inmates in the Alexandria jail for less expensive, more appropriate um, deten uh, alternative sentences. Uh, for instance, a lot of folks in your local jail mm -hmm. suffer from mental illness, and they're not receiving the appropriate treatment. Sure. And so they get arrested, and then, you know, they serve a period of days, and then they get out, and then they, then they, they offend again because they haven't received the necessary mm -hmm. services. Mm -hmm. Similar to drug treatment. Uh, in addiction, they continue to steal so that they can get money for drugs, or they write prescription fraud, and, and, um, and, and you know, addicted to painkilling, like Vicodin and Percocet. So what you need in the jails it's not only just about punishment, but obviously sure. keeping our citizens safe, and that's a chief responsibility of government to keep our the homes and businesses safe, but also to prevention, you know, in terms of providing the necessary services, because frankly, it's cheaper in, in the long run for well, taxpayers to, to treat the problem no. up front and give them the necessary services so they don't reoffend and re you know, victimize someone. On another venue you know, related to the issue of prevention, I noticed uh, I was very interested in the prevention and vaccinations for children, yeah. preventative health care in particular. Yeah. Tell us yeah, more yeah. about that. Yeah, I, I have a real detailed plan with respect to health care. I, I want to enroll every single Virginia child in health care. We have 200,000 kids right now without any health insurance, and that's, I believe, a moral responsibility to get those kids health care, but also an economic necessity because healthy kids grow up to be healthy, productive adults. So it, again, it's one of those smart investments um, that pays dividends in the long run. Um, it, child immunization was something that I pushed uh, for chicken pox way back when. I have two small children. Wife and I have an eight-year-old and a seven-year-old. And it was our family uh, pediatrician who, who mentioned, you know, in Virginia, we don't require chicken pox vaccination. Mm -hmm. So I went to the legislature and made it happen to keep uh, kids 
healthy and grow up to be healthy, productive adults. How, so would, you, how would you feel about this woman who, of course, has been in the news lately and the child is, is oh. missing and there hasn't been well, vaccination, obviously. It's, a, well, it's an it's ethical uh, issue for, for her. Uh, not only vaccination, I think it has to do with chemotherapy. And yes, it's cancer, excuse me, yeah. chemotherapy, but the issue is the yeah, same. Those are, those are pretty uh, difficult issues, you know, uh, personal uh, determinations. But, you know, we... Um, um, you want the, it, what's in the best interest of the child, and, and mm -hmm. the child at this point, less than 18, um, is, is my knowledge of that case. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think at some point the state has a responsibility to make sure that person has access to health care. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, we know that um, well, you know those uh, treatments have not been the um, alternative treatments have not been determined to be as successful. As, as chemotherapy, so that's a very difficult issue. Mm -hmm. But uh, I want to make sure that you know every child in Virginia has access to health care. Yeah, so I was choose. curious on your thoughts on that, and also related to uh, care and mental health, yeah. are vets coming back? Oh, yes. Obviously, you know they have job issues, retraining, but also a lot of them have the trauma of combat, and there are severe mental health issues. Yes. How would you yes. deal with that, and also how would you find funding? Yeah. Well, I'm glad you asked that, Jan, because just yesterday I announced um, a um, military bill of rights and a veterans, uh, detailed veterans plans mm -hmm. with respect to um, assisting them with jobs, uh, introducing them into the green energy economy jobs that I want to create, uh, in addition to assisting those in, in homeowner bill of rights. You know, uh, the foreclosure crisis we're experiencing right now falls heavily, heavily disproportionately on our military and minority families. Mm -hmm. There's an area around the Quantico Marine Base in Prince William County where foreclosures have increased by 414%. Oh, yeah. I have a friend who did two tours in Iraq, and he's about to go back to Afghanistan. Yeah. He has been keeping up the payments on his house, but the company that has it reneged on their agreements, and mm -hmm. he lost his house. Well, that's to no one fighting for our freedoms in Iraq and Afghanistan should return to home to a foreclosed house. I want to give them special... Uh, ability to give them a l longer period of time to get their financial house in order because that's just not right. And so in the area of, of uh, home foreclosures, additional rights, jobs, and third, what you mentioned with respect to when they return with Veterans, injuries, mm -hmm. uh, polytrauma, post-traumatic st stress syndrome uh, disorder. And we have a wonderful facility that, uh, in Hunter McGuire Medical Facility in Richmond. It's a polytrauma center. It's one of five in the, in, in the country. What happens, they receive that care, but does that care follow them when they return to their community? And that's what community-based services we need to um, beef up and support. So That, that is can. the issue because so many people fall through the cracks, mm -hmm. and which brings me around to education yeah. and kids who are falling through the cracks, too. Uh, and uh, you're talking about contributing to education at all levels, and again, it's always an issue of funding, funding, funding. Mm -hmm. But I was interested to hear well, your thoughts. That, I know. K through kindergarten in particular yeah. is of interest to you and higher right. education, research. Right. Tell me some yeah, more yeah. about that. Great. Well, uh, with two children in the public schools, this is very important to mm -hmm. me personally. My sure. third grader just uh, took her first SOL exam in reading last week, and uh, she feels she did very well. And, um, she has science next week. She wanted to make sure I was home for her next <laughs> exam. Um, we have to have a lifelong learning process here. It begins with quality preschool education so that get uh, these young minds as early as mm -hmm. possible when they're, you know, formative years so that they reach kindergarten, they're ready to learn. Um, and then K through three, very important years. Uh, those are the years you want to make sure we have uh, small class sizes, as individual instruction as, as you can achieve, um, and good teachers in the classroom. You know, sure. I've fought and battled in the legislature to increase teacher salaries to the national average. We must attract, retain, and reward the best teachers. Um, and then right throughout, we have to uh, address our high school graduation rates. Charlottesville's doing pretty well. We have 90%, only 10% drop out. Of course, that's one out of 10. We do need to address mm -hmm. that and make sure mm -hmm. 10 of 10 We do graduate. have excellent schools here. It's but true. You do, uh, you, you're better than state average, and I congratulate the Charlottesville area for that. Um, and then college affordability is very important. I, I want more collaboration with our community college mm -hmm. and our business community as well for purposes of this economy and job creation. Um, we need to communicate with our business community as to what jobs are available, where are we going in terms of demographics. For, as a, for example, the healthcare professions. You know, we have an aging population. Mm -hmm. There will be job growth in that sector, and we need to now 
change our curriculums or modify our curriculums to make sure we're graduating the students with the skills necessary to work the jobs that are necessary for the future, particularly in the healthcare professionals, professions. And, um, and, and I want to make sure we do that as well. And not everyone goes on to college either, the high schools, we need to make sure that they receive technical and vocational education so that they can graduate with a skill that's marketable and they can get a job. How do you feel about mentoring programs for kids? Yeah, I think that's, that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. uh, how would you? How yeah, would you well, a lot of our that? seniors, our retired, um, our retired um, uh, individuals can mm -hmm. get back into the classroom, work with our education system, um, take advantage of the wonderful, you know, experiences and knowledge we have in, in Virginia with, in our military. You know, that was a part of my military package as well. You know, uh, they're, they're disciplined, they're, mm -hmm. they're knowledgeable, they're uh, exhibit leadership. Great skill sets. Great yeah. skill sets, and we should introduce them into our um, student population uh, for purposes of um, you know disseminating that type of leadership skills and that knowledge and, um, and they want to do it with it's a matter of matching up and integrating um, the system to to incorporate some of those retired folks as well as our retired military it's an interest intriguing idea about the military people too because you the byproduct of it also is that you're exposing the kids to what that's all about what mm -hmm. these people actually look at uh, as instead of just numbers on a screen for casualties and so forth, so it's uh, well, you know, we don't have socially. a national draft, and so I, you know, the more you introduce our young people to that, I think there's a sense yeah. of national, you know, kind of a service corps, or national pride in our um, country. So I, I think there's a lot of benefits mm -hmm. that can uh, be associated with that initiative. Yeah. You met, you asked about six things. We've covered a lot of them. We Jane. have you covered a lot. So, we, so now you have to small go to businesses strengthening <laughs> our economy. <laughs> Education is a part right. of it, absolutely. Excellence in education, healthcare, ensuring every single child. Um, the Good uh, recap. Green, we haven't gotten into <laughs> the uh, green energy jobs. Well, and, we're, uh, I was coming oh, to okay, that, and I also Good. wanted to ask you because I was curious. Um, you're no on offshore drilling, is yeah. that correct? Yeah, I'm the is only one running that has opposed offshore drilling, and and will as governor. And I also oppose the new coal-fired power plant in Surrey, Virginia, which is in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. So I've that's taken a firm no. <laughs> yeah, it <laughs> will happen shift. on the next governor's watch. Okay. Uh, so when the application was submitted in December, I said, no, it's mm -hmm. in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. We re I want to get serious about developing a clean energy system. Um, a 20, you know, facing our 21st century challenges, you can't rely on 19th century solutions. I, I truly believe in being some innovative um, industries, mm -hmm. research into cleaner technologies. Um, you know, we let's harness wind and solar on a 24-hour basis that's dependable and reliable. That was going to be my next cell, question. Battery cell wind. technology necessary to do that. I yeah. know it doesn't exist now, but that's the type of research, mm -hmm. that's the type mm -hmm. of focus and attention we need to pay because, you know, we can, we can draw the, the connect the dots between energy, mm -hmm. uh, the economy, strengthening our economy, and protecting our environment. And that is very key. I mean, to build, to go offshore is very costly future. The uh, future economic viability of that does not make sense. Do you same feel the same way about wind, offshore wind uh, possibility, I, I want, something McAuliffe has talked right, about? I, well, I want offshore wind. I was the first one to come out. Um, he talks about it a lot more because he has a lot more mail to talk about it. I've been talking about that for years. Uh, I was there in 2007. How do you protect stood the fragile? On the shores of the, I sh stood on the shores right. of Virginia Beach in 2007 okay. with the mayor, with the uh, Sierra Club, with the former Department of Environmental Quality mm -hmm. under George Allen. It was a bipartisan effort to say no to offshore, but yes to wind. That was two years ago. Um, we need to put windmills off the coast of okay. Virginia Beach, uh, not uh, drilling rigs. I have that a question, will, so I'm just going to interrupt you for a go second ahead, here. Because I know you're on a roll, and it's great. Um, uh, how do you protect the fragile marine life when you put a wind machine in, a, in the, say, off the Chesapeake Bay? Do you worry about disruption of the ecology, or is that the, not an issue? Uh, the far more disruption from um, the drilling rigs and then all the apparatus necessary to transmit and, and um, all that, whatever is found okay. out there, whether it be oil or natural gas. Uh, the wind, the studies indicate there's far less ecological disruption. Very interesting. Yeah, hmm. far less. Um, and if we put them approximately 20 miles off, you can't even see them. Um, and, and so it, the information, mm -hmm. the research I've done, it's far more um, 
helpful to the, you know, we have a billion dollar tourism industry in Virginia Beach and the great sure concern do. of Virginia sure Beach do. is that it's an economic engine there and they're, they're worried what the environmental hazards would be from drilling. We also have the naval operations, which is an enormous economic engine, lots of jobs in, in, in Virginia Beach and Norfolk and Hampton Roads area, that they oppose offshore drilling as well. So I, I'm in good company. I'm the mm -hmm. only one out there, though, mm -hmm. in terms of gubernatorial candidates that oppose offshore drilling. Uh, I, I think it's the right decision. We can create thousands of green energy jobs, weatherizing our homes, refitting our buildings, installing solar panels mm -hmm. on our homes mm -hmm. and businesses, and, and plugging that into a smart grid technology. You know, President Barack Obama's put money into smart yes. grid technology. He Absolutely. understands that. I want to partner with him. We can create jobs and protect our environment for the next generation. I mean, well, we should be good stewards you're of right. our environment. You're right about that. Um, now, the two-term governor business. It's I an support interesting two -term idea. We, now, we, of course, if uh, that were true now, you'd be not quite seeking the job just yet. Right. No, I, so. I think Tim Kaine's <laughs> done a great job, and right. I, I would uh, I would have liked the, Tim to have had a, another chance. Uh, you know, Tim has uh, tried to accomplish transportation. He's had a bad budget. He has done some wonderful reform in the mental health mm -hmm. system. Invested uh, higher education he bond sure package for capital. Uh, so. Tim's done a great job. I, I wish he'd had another opportunity. We should have two-term governor. We're the only state in the nation who has one term uh, for any strategic planning now for long term, like transportation. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, to get rail and transit where we need it, high-speed rail and passenger rail and freight rail, that takes years to develop. And, and you mm -hmm. know, you need some continuity with respect to uh, gubernatorial administrations. But unfortunately, now I will continue on what Mark Warner and Tim Kane have started. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll try to finish and, and continue much of what they've started, but um, I, I do believe in two-term governor. I think it would help uh, how we are able to manage and lead Virginia. I actually, ag I agree. I think, I think that's quite true. Um, bringing industries to Virginia. Mm -hmm. um, again, you know, McAuliffe has talked about the film industry, about certain other ones. What are your sort of pet projects to, mm -hmm. to bring to well, Virginia just um, now? Again, you know, I have a record. Uh, mm -hmm. I have the, a body of experience doing this. I'm the only one running for governor okay. who has actually been overseas to bring business mm -hmm. here to Virginia. I know exactly what conversation has to occur. Do you have particular businesses in mind? Well, we've, let me, uh, I was in India and uh, we were there on a governor's trade mission mm -hmm. with India. High technology, also uh, agribusiness. Mm -hmm. uh, we brought over, over uh, hundreds of millions of dollars of economic activity from India to Virginia. Um, I was in Israel in September, sat with three different CEOs, one a biocancer research firm. We wanted to track them to the biotech center mm -hmm. in Richmond, talk to them about what assets we have in Virginia. That's a wonderful clean industry, high paying jobs, technology, biocancer research. Also manufacturing CEO, met with a manufacturer who manufactures safety glass um, for uh, Humvees which are used in Iraq and sure. Afghanistan. The, our proximity to the Pentagon is something we sold. Mm -hmm. They're now uh, created hundreds of jobs in Greensville County, Virginia. We have that now in Virginia. Third group was another technology. We went to an Air Force base in Israel, and um, the, the technology they used to keep all their planes um, uh, up, up on maintenance and the mm -hmm. staffing has commercial applications to hospitals. So they're converting that technology into some commercial application that we might be able to have peak performance, maximum performance in our hospitals with respect to equipment and staffing. So I'm actually the one not just talking about it, but have done it. You're and, the go-to uh, guy. I've been, I've, been, <laughs> I've been there. I know exactly yeah. what we need to sell in Virginia. We have a lot to sell. There's a lot of exciting things we'll be able to do here oh, I like Virginia. your confidence. It's great. Oh, hey, there's a, lot, there's a lot to sell. I mean, we have every, whatever it is you want in Virginia, we have it in Virginia. Mm -hmm. We have beaches, we have mountains, we have the Piedmont, we have wonderful colleges and universities, and UVA and tech and so many colleges and universities. We have a strong, skilled workforce. We have proximity to the port of Hampton Roads, which is an enormous economic engine. We have proximity to the Pentagon. We have proximity to the federal government. No, we have it all. What okay, uh, cycling back, I wanted to ask you again about jobs because as you know, in Charlottesville, as many places, it's jobs, jobs, jobs. What what about the person who can't get the loan, the bank won't loan, Bank of America, Citigroup, whatever it is, mm -hmm. BB&T here. Mm -hmm. um, how do you help that person? Mm -hmm. uh, if he's really about to go under, let's say he's been in business 10, 15, 20 years. Yeah. He's been a good, he, he's a safe uh, business. There's no risk there, but still he's not getting a loan. And I know lots of these people and they're not gonna be here for long. Yeah, yeah. So well, what do we do? 
Well, uh, it's a multifold approach. I mean, uh, Charlottesville has approximately 13 to 14 percent unemployment. That's too much. Uh, you know, there's the first thing you do is, is assist those who are un, un, out of work. Um, you know, I was in Martinsville back in 2000 when Tultex got up and left because of um, NAFTA. They got up, they moved to Mexico, and hundreds of workers were out mm -hmm. of work. They were terrified. I went there, I, I heard their stories and saw their faces. They were worried about providing health insurance to their kids. They were yeah, they're mortgaged double the rent, digits. Double oh, yeah. digits. Now they're oh, yeah. 20, over 20%. Oh, yeah. um, we returned to Richmond and fought for increased unemployment benefits mm -hmm. and health insurance for those, for those folks on a temporary basis. Um, we passed it in the legislature. Jim Gilmore, a Republican, voted no. That's why you need a Democrat in the governor's office. I agree. Um, and the next year, Mark Warner signed that legislation. This year, this president of Congress saw fit to help those unemployed workers. They appropriated $125 million for Virginia to retrain those workers. Oh, I and uh, I would have accepted that money. Bob McDonald and the Republicans said no. I would have said yes. Uh, we need to have brought those resources into Virginia to retrain those workers, retrain them in fields where there are shortages, like the healthcare profession. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a family of seven kids. Our um, the, our dad, when he was laid off from a big company that got bought out, uh, we lost the family station wagon. It served as the company car that also served as the family station wagon. It was towed out of the driveway with a bunch of kids. Um, that had a lasting impact on our family and our beliefs. And the belief is the most important job, or the most important social program of all is a job. And it's, I thought, found it to be unconscionable that the Republicans would say no to those resources to retrain our workers, because that's the first thing we do is get folks who are unemployed, who, who, who are terrified of it, and paying their bills well, back Well, exactly, because what I keep hearing is, um, you know, yes, I believe in infrastructure, yes, I believe in biofuels and, in, and all the rest of it, but right now I don't have a job, yeah, and I'm about ready right. to lose my business, all and first things first. You, you get them first things first as you get them retrained, you get them in, mm -hmm. in training skills that are necessary. I mean, we have a metro project in Northern Virginia, metro out to Dulles. We have four, need for 400 welders. And I, I want those welders yeah. to come right from Virginia. Let's get them to work. I mean, that's the first thing you do, get people back to work. And then all of the other initiatives that we have with green energy jobs, weatherization money, the president has provided us $160 million. That can provide jobs mm -hmm. as well. And um, I, would, I would do that for indigent families and seniors who are on fixed incomes who are struggling to pay the utility bills and, and, um, I would, and prescription drug medicine. Mm -hmm. I, would, I would retrofit their homes because that achieves the stated purpose of energy efficiency sure. as well as putting people to work and sure. helping those seniors pay the bills. So uh, there are things you can do immediately. For long term, it's an education system. Mm -hmm. It's a strong, skilled mm -hmm. workforce. It's a broad broadband. You know, uh, Universal broadband, it's an infrastructure it. mm -hmm. that's necessary to make sure Virginia is competitive. For rural and, areas. And, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and I'll tell you, we, we, you know, what being in China, um, we were in India, as I said, you know, they're graduating 350,000 engineers. Mm -hmm. um, well, China's graduating 600,000. You have engineers. a we, very broad program, and yeah. only in the interest of time would I interrupt you because it's really <laughs> fascinating Good. to hear this. Um, uh, I would happen to be uh, up in Northern Virginia a while back, and uh, former President Clinton was in an event there, uh, and he talked about uh, the fact that politics, in politics, we often focus on what we do, on who we are. And, you know, I'm an artist, I'm a teacher, I'm a bricklayer, uh, but the how gets, yeah. gets lost. And so I feel, you know, how we accomplish our goals is incredibly important. And finally, yeah. we cannot always choose who we are, where we live, or what we do, but or what happens to us, as with Katrina or 9-11, but we can choose the way we respond, as President Clinton describes. That's where real freedom lies for us, not who or what we elect, but how we move forward, I think, yeah. is important. And that's where politics matters. Yeah. Again, I want to thank you, Brian, My for pleasure. being our guest today and sharing your, your thoughts with us. Thank you again. I'm Jan Painter, and this is Politics Matters.